Good morning, church. Good morning, brothers and sisters, family. It's a joy and a pleasure for me to be able to be here and see each one of you here today as well. And I praise the Lord for the privilege of being able to get up here and share with you. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit will work through me to bring a blessing to you. I've entitled the sermon today, Regrets or Victory? You know, we're coming to the end of another year. I mean, this is the last Sabbath of 2015. And just in a few more days, we'll be in 2016. And it seems impossible. Where has this year gone to? It's gone by so fast. It just seems impossible. But praise the Lord. The time is going by fast. That means Jesus' coming is that much closer. And so, it's really interesting. Um, I don't know if any of you have been thinking these past few days anything about the New Year's resolutions you have, may have made at the beginning of 2015. And um, some of you may even be thinking about new New Year's resolutions you may be making in the days to come ahead. Okay? And that's good. Resolutions are good things to have. Um, but I think at the same time, if you're thinking about resolutions, something different, something new, that means that there must be some regrets or some maybe dissatisfactions with how you've lived in the past year. Okay? So when we look at our defects and where we haven't come up to even our own standards or our own desires for ourselves, then that means there's room for change. And we should have that desire to change. Okay? I don't know if you're aware of it, but a large percentage of the New Year's resolutions that people may make generally are totally forgotten of within a couple of weeks into the new year. So it takes something special to help us make a New Year's resolution and then carry it on through with us the entire year. Okay? And I think it's important that we begin to meditate a little bit about this. And I'd like to just comment about a few of some of the more common New Year's resolutions that people may make. For instance, losing X amount of pounds. That seems to be one of the most common. Almost everybody starts the year wanting to lose some weight, especially after the big meals of Christmas and New Year's and whatnot. Most people put on some weight and so, okay, New Year, we got to lose some weight. And that's good. Some say, well, we're going to do more exercise. They realize in the last year they didn't do exercise, exercise like they ought to. So this New Year, we're going to do more exercise. Others may think, well, we're going to eat a better diet. We're going to be more careful with what we eat. Eat a cleaner and better diet. And each of these things are good and they're important, okay? Others may think, well, this year I'm going to keep my house in order. I'm going to keep it cleaner. Or it may be the yard or the garden or the garage. You know, the garage seems to be a catch-all. <laughs> but it's a good thing to make a resolution of keeping it in order. Um, my, I have a son-in-law out in California. You'd be surprised at the order in his garage. It's amazing. The floor is spick and span. He's got everything in little containers on shelves. He knows exactly where everything is. And I admire him for that. You know, I think that's amazing. Some may be thinking about showing more care for those that are in need. Or we may have regrets of not spending more time with the family. And we may make that choice, that decision to want to spend more time with, with family. Others may be thinking about more personal devotion time. And these are things that are good and important. Okay? And I think we should have these things in mind. Or those that are in school may be thinking about getting better grades or studying harder. And so these are things that are, are really good and, and these are things that can help better ourselves. But an important thing that we should understand is that success only comes by change. Okay? 
if we're unsatisfied with what we've been doing but yet we continue doing the same thing what change is there going to be? No change. So we need to be willing to get out of our comfort zone and say okay with God's blessing and his help and he can help us make these changes. So when we realize that there's been things in our lives that we need to change, we should have the courage to do it. Okay? And um, it's only as we see these defects and these dissatisfactions in our lives that we will have the di desire to make any changes. But what criteria should we use to base these changes on? Okay, I think this is an important question. And yes, definitely, the Word of God. But I'd like to have you um, go with me to Romans. And before we do that, though, let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you because it gives us instructions and guides us in what we need to know so that we can make proper choices day by day. Bless us as we go into it this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Romans 7. And we're going to look at verses 7 and 12. Romans chapter 7. And Paul says here, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So again, here we see that the law of God is like a mirror. As we go and look in the mirror and see how we're, our hair is all messed up, our face is dirty, that's the only way we're going to know that we need to straighten our hair out or wash our face. Okay? And that's the way it is with the law of God. And then verse 12 says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Okay? So God's law is holy, and it's just, and it's good. We can't go wrong if we choose to try to go along with God's word. And if we remember Isaiah 8.20, it says, To the law and to the testimony. Okay? So what we do in our lives needs to be in harmony with the law and with the testimony. And it's, it's interesting, as you go on through chapter 7 of Romans, we see that Paul had some of these problems and, and battles that each one of us may have in our daily life. And we can read on to, through it real quick. Romans 7, starting with verse 15. For that which... Well, let's start with 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Each of us are carnal. Our tendencies are carnal, earthly. And this is why we need that new birth. But he goes on to say, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me there is, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not do, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin and it is in that is which is in my members o wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from this body of death so we see clearly that paul had this battle in his life and each one of us have a similar battle day by day but there's hope okay 
So what is the motivating or what should be the motivating factor that inspires us to want to change? And I invite you to go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5 and we're going to read um, verses 14 and 21. Second Corinthians 5 14 says knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise uh, shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you let's see here that's not right second Corinthians 5 14 oh, okay 5 14 I'm sorry I was in the wrong chapter here we go uh, for the love of Christ that's the words I wanted to say the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Christ loved us so much that he was willing to be made sin in our place. He took our sins upon himself and died the death on the cross that each one of us deserves. Now that's pretty powerful. And that should be a powerful motivating factor in the choices that we make day by day. And especially when we see that not only did he become sin for us, and he knew no sin in his own life. He had lived a righteous life. But he did it so that we might be made righteousness of God in him. So as by faith we accept Christ Jesus, we are then made righteousness in Jesus. And that is, that is amazing. That is marvelous when we stop and think about it. And then we can go on and see a couple other verses right there in the same chapter. Verse 15 says, And he that died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Oh, so there's something else. <laughs> Those of us that live, it's important that from now on we shouldn't live to ourselves. But, it goes on, verse 15, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Okay? Many times the motivation behind the choices that we make are strictly selfish just because I want this or I want that or I would feel good with this and we base many times our choices on our feelings but when we take into account what the Lord Jesus did for us and dying for us then we would want to live for him shouldn't we you know I think if we were in a very dangerous situation and someone was to save us how would we feel toward that person well, Jesus did much more than that for us. Amen. Okay? So we should be willing to completely give ourselves to him and not live for ourselves any longer. And then verse 17, I love it, says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So now you see the secret in this text? <coughs> being in Christ Jesus okay because it says if any man or woman or child be in Christ he is a new creature Isn't that beautiful so the important thing is that we be in Christ then we can be sure that we are new creatures in him and through him now some may be, fee be feeling guilt because of not fulfilling the things that they had promised they'd do at the beginning of last year. <laughs> Some even may be feeling condemnation. And you know, the law, when we break it, does condemn. That's what the law does. It condemns us. It condemns us to death. When we break the law, we are condemned to death. Okay? Some of, some of us may have made some resolutions like maybe not eating between meals anymore or trying to care for our bodies and not drinking with our meals or 
We may even make that choice of not eating any more suppers or at least no late or heavy suppers because we know that is harmful for our body. Okay? But then we find that throughout the year we did eat suppers or we did eat between meals just like we had before. So what's, what's it going to take to change? Okay? We find that we've failed miserably many times. And sometimes when we've failed, we have a tendency of generalizing things. We may have only failed once or twice, but yet the devil comes along and makes us think thoughts like, oh, I'll never be able to overcome that. Or he may even make us feel, I'll always mess up. Or I could never do things right. Or I'm a failure in everything. And we have that tendency to generalize then. And we have to be careful not to do that. You know, our character is not judged by a little failure once in a while, but by the general tendency of our intentions in how we live. Okay? So when we choose to live according to God's law, but we fall once in a while, what can we do? Instead of thinking these evil thoughts, oh, I'll never be able to overcome. I always fail. And this is what devil, the devil wants us to think. He wants us to think these negative thoughts because then he knows that we'll go into depression. So many people that are depressed, it's because they feel like they're a failure always. And especially if somebody points out their failure to them. That makes it, you know, and the, the power of our words is unbelievable in our lives. The power of suggestion Somebody says, oh man, you can never do anything right. From that time onward, we may go on through life thinking we're a failure, that we can never do anything right. Okay? And when we say it to ourselves, it has just as much power over us. Okay? And we go into bondage under the power of Satan when we claim you can never, when we say to ourselves, you can never do anything right. Okay? You're a failure in everything. So we have to be careful how we speak to ourselves. Okay? And better than that, we can use God's Word. When we get, have these thoughts in our mind, we should go to the Word and claim the promises. For instance, 1 John 1, 9. And I think we all know it by memory. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. Huh? How about Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then if we go right on to verse 19, it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know, we've got these beautiful, beautiful promises and we need to learn to make these promises ours. And then... Another text that should give us courage is the one that was read for our scripture reading this morning. And that's Romans 8, 37. This is, Nay, in all these things ye are more than conquerors through him that loves us. Praise the Lord. So, as we realize the errors that we've made in the past, we should look to Jesus to be able to have the strength to go forward making the proper choices from now on. Now, there's a prayer that we have heard many times, I believe. There's plaques that have it and the ones that um, go to the AA meetings, the Alcoholics Anonymous. Many times they use this prayer that says, Lord, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Okay, and I think it's important that we recognize there are some things we can't change. For instance, our stature. Or maybe our last name. <laughs> you know, it could be any of these things, the color of our skin, that I've got freckles. Or whatever it may be. I was going to say the color of our hair, but many people do change the color of their hair. <laughs> so I'm not going to say that one. But whatever it is, if there are things that we can't change, we need to learn to accept it. All right? And by God's grace, know that His grace is sufficient for us in those areas. But then it says we should have the courage. We say, Lord, give me the courage to change the things I can change. 
So if there is something that is bothering us that we're not satisfied with and we know we need to change, then we need to tighten our belt and say, okay, put, our, put the pants on, you might say, and say, all right, I will change it with God's help. Okay? Because everything we do depends on the proper working of our will. Okay? It's a choice that we have to make. It's an individual, conscientious choice that each of us have to make to be able to make changes. We can't make changes if we're just, oh, yeah, I'd like to, but, well, I know I can't. Okay? So, then it ends by saying, and Lord, give us the wisdom to know the difference between the things we can't change and the things we can change. <laughs> okay? We need to have that wisdom, that guidance, that specific guidance. And again, we find it in God's Word. Okay? God's Word is full of instructions to give us the right way in which we should live. Now, if we go back to the beginning of chapter 8 of, of Romans, I love the way it starts. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Isn't that beautiful? There's no condemnation. Okay? And many times I'll use the, the example of when we're driving down the road. If the speed limit is 35 and we're doing 55, and all of a sudden on down the way we see a policeman come around the corner, what do we do? <laughs> Boy, we step on the brakes. Oh, I hope he didn't see me. I hope he didn't see me. I hope he didn't see me. Okay? We already feel the condemnation of the law. Right? Because we know we we're doing wrong. But if I'm driving 32 in a 35 speed limit, 35 mile an hour speed limit, and I see the policeman, I can even smile at him and greet him with a waving of the hand. Why? Because I'm at peace. There's no condemnation. Okay? So as day by day we submit to the law, there's no condemnation because we're not living according to flesh anymore but according to the Spirit. And I love Paul goes on. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus you must be born again. Okay? And this is this experience each one of us needs. But ye are not in the flesh verse 9 but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, each one of us, as we have gone into the baptismal pit and been buried under the water and raised up, that's a symbol of death to self and being resurrected in new life and being filled with the Holy Spirit at that time. Okay? And that should be the experience and it's an ongoing thing that needs to be renewed every single day as we go forward. So then it goes on saying, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, but to live, uh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But, if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. 
for as many as are led by the Spirit of God they are the sons of God for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father so each one of us have been adopted into the family of Christ when we accept Christ as our Savior and he wants us to live in that full realization that as we accept his spirit in our life we can live in accordance to the spirit and not after the flesh there's a text that says that the Bible is full of great and wonderful promises whereby we become partakers of the divine nature having how does it say having escaped from the corruption that's in the world through lust okay but the important thing is it's giving us two different areas here Fa living by the spirit and living by the flesh and we're warned not to live double-mindedly <laughs> many of us want the best of both worlds yeah we want to be saved we want to go to heaven but yet we want the pleasures of this world and of the flesh okay but in James chapter 4 if you'd like to turn there with me James chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8 we find that it says <coughs> James 4 7 submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he will flee from you okay so the first step is to submit okay submit to the Lord when we do that then we can resist the devil and he will flee from us and then verse 8 says draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you and many times we stop right there but the verse goes on it says cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double-minded okay so God doesn't want us to be double-minded he wants us to be singled out to him and verse uh, chapter um, 1 and verse 8 of, the, of um, James also says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways okay so <laughs> we mustn't be unstable and just before it says he that lacketh faith is like a wave of the sea that's driven by the wind and tossed okay <laughs> so a double-minded person is also like a wave of the sea that's driven by the wind and tossed okay there's not stability in a person that's double-minded so we could say that being double-minded is like being lukewarm okay <laughs> in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15 and 16 it tells us that I wish you were either hot or cold but because you're neither hot or cold I'll spew you out of my mouth okay we want both things we want to be hot and cold and we can't do that but this is the condition many times of our church today just taking the middle of the road not taking a stand on either side one or the other okay but very soon we're going to be forced to take a stand we're living in the time in which we will be seeing the fulfillment of laws made by our government requiring us to go against God's law and when that time comes we will have to make a choice and when we make that choice we will be sealed we're living in the sealing time okay so it's important that we not be lukewarm anymore that we not be double-minded as a matter of fact Jesus said in Matthew 6 24 Matthew 6 24 And Jesus says there no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other ye cannot serve God and mammon okay 
So there again, God wants us to be single-minded to him and to his will and to his honor and glory. <laughs> Luke 9.23 says, If any man would follow after me, what should he do? Deny himself and then take up his cross and follow. Okay? Now, some might get the idea that we need to carry a cross with us every place we go. And we've seen a man carrying a big cross. Now he had to laugh a little bit because he had a, a cushion on his shoulder where the cross laid and then he had a wheel on the back end of the, the cross so it'd roll along, okay? But that's not what it's talking about. And some of you may have seen me illustrate this before but I believe that the cross that each one of us need to take is the cross showing up in the fact that we as humans, carnally, our will goes horizontally, earthly, carnally and God's will goes vertically. Okay? And there's the cross that each one of us need to face every single day. What am I going to do today? My will? What I want to do? Or the Father's will? And that's where we need to get on our knees and say, Father, take my will. I give you permission to take it and put it in harmony with your will so that I can delight in doing what you would have me to do. Okay? And I think that's really an important point. And then every time we take our will back to do what we want to do, again we got to fall on our knees and say, Father, forgive me. Take my will. I give you permission. And again, put it in harmony with your will so I can delight in doing your will. Okay? So this is really an important point that comes about day by day in our, in our daily lives. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2 and it goes on explaining the type of mind that the Lord wants each of us to have. And we'll start with verse 5. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man and being found in the fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> If Christ was willing to give up sitting on the throne, being equal with his Father in heaven, being co-creator of this earth with his Father, and yet he was willing to give all that up to come and be born in a manger in the poorest conditions. Didn't even have a, a proper house to be born in, but with the animals. <laughs> That's pretty heavy, okay? So, why then should we strive to be somebody when the creator of the earth didn't even strive to be anybody except to do the, fa the Father's will? That's all he sought during the time he was on this earth, to do the Father's will. But then, if we jump on to verse 12, the last part, it admonishes us that we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, we shouldn't slack off. Okay? We can't take a vacation time. Okay, I've been doing the Lord's will all this time. I'm going to take a vacation. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do now. <laughs> That's not what it's about. Okay? We should work for our salvation with fear and trembling. But then the next verse goes on to say, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Okay? But we need to be after ourselves. The battle's not against others. The battle is against ourselves. Okay? And we need to be f battling to bring our thoughts into harmony with God, our will into harmony with God, our mind to be stayed on Christ. <coughs> And of course, Solomon in Proverbs 
uh, 4.23 tells us that above all things we should guard our heart. Now that's not talking about the muscle that pumps blood. It's talking about our minds, where our conscience is, where the Holy Spirit communicates to us and with us. Okay? It's only through our frontal lobe of our brain that we receive the impressions of the Holy Spirit. So as we conscientiously give our heart to the Lord, our mind to the Lord, and guard it. Now what do we have to do to guard our minds? <laughs> Go with me to um, 2 Corinthians again. This time chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, yes, we are in a fleshy, flesh body yet, okay? Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay? So, many people will try to excuse themselves. Well, it's hereditary. I can't overcome that. <laughs> Who says we can't? And that's where the new birth needs to take place. Okay? Just because my father did it, my grandfather did it, doesn't mean I have to do it. We can be changed. These imaginations can be cast down. Now the devil would like to make us think that we're prisoners of his and we can't overcome. But here it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but are mighty through God because Jesus overcame, we can overcome just as he did. And of course, if we go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So when somebody says something bad to you, we should remember that it's not that person. It's the devil working through that person. Okay? So when somebody says something bad to us or does something bad to us, to hurt us, let's remember that it's not that person, but it's the devil trying to get to us through that person. Okay? And we can forgive that person because at that moment they were being an instrument in the hands of the devil. Okay? Therefore, we shouldn't hold grudges against them, but we should forgive but it goes on, verse 13, Wherefore take, upon, uh, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And then it describes the armor of a Roman soldier having the loins girt about with truth. And where do we find truth? Only in the Word of God. Okay? And then it says, having the breastplate of righteousness. And the breastplate was to protect the heart and the lungs from swords or spears or arrows. Okay? And then the next part is the, the feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Okay? The soldier many times was required to run through woods where there were thorns and prickers. If he had been barefoot, it would have been a, a problem. But having the feet shod, he was able to run quickly, swiftly. And this is what God wants us to do today. To run quickly, swiftly with our feet prepared and wherever we go to take the gospel of peace. To give the good news that Christ came and died and was resurrected and lives to intercede in our behalf. And then it goes on. Above all, Take the shield of faith with which you shall be able to put out or quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation 
Again, the helmet is to protect our head. And there we have the major number of senses, our sight, our smell, our hearing, our mouth. God wants us to keep that under control, okay? And to be protected from the bombardment of the temptations of the devil and the things that surround us. And then, not only the helmet, but then we should have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the Bible, okay? And verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So there again we see how God wants us to protect our mind, to protect our body from the attacks of the evil that surround us in this world today because it's very prevalent. The battle is a real battle. <laughs> it's not something that is just imaginary. Okay? And so we have to be careful and be protected by this armor, which in Romans 13 tells us it's Christ Jesus himself. Okay? It's Christ Jesus himself that gives us that protection that we need day by day. So even though we may not have attained to all the goals and resolutions that we may have made 12 months ago, there is something we can do and we should do. And we can find that in Philippians chapter 3. Paul here describes and tells what he did. Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, Paul says, not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay? So maybe we didn't fulfill our resolutions in the last year. But now God gives us a new opportunity. Every day is a new opportunity to go forward and trusting in him to be able to grow and to become perfect in Christ Jesus. So we need to fix our eye on Jesus. He's the one. He's our example. Go back to 2 Corinthians with me, chapter 3 and verse 18. Second Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Praise the Lord, huh? So as we look into Jesus' face through his word it's like as if we're looking in a mirror but we see Jesus' face reflected here. Okay? As we look, by beholding, we are changed. And so day by day, from now onward, we need to determine to make Jesus the first thing in our life. Okay? We need to choose to make him that which we focus on. He should be our main focus so that we can be changed. Otherwise, there's no way we can change for the good. Where is Jesus right now? In the most holy place. In the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, remember, he's our high priest. And since 1844, he's in the most holy place. We are living in the great antitypical day of atonement. Okay? Now, in the ancient times, when the day of atonement came around, what did the children of Israel have to do? Three days before, they needed to wash their bodies and wash their clothes, okay? And the Day of Atonement, the Bible says, they afflicted their souls. Do you know what that means? They fasted. They didn't eat. They didn't do anything to gratify self during that day because they were 
Now, in the three previous days, they were to confess their sins one to another and to forgive one another. Because if they had any sins unforgiven, when the, whole, the high priest went into the most holy place, the high priest would die because of those sins that were uncorrected. So if today we're living in the great antitypical day of atonement, <laughs> how should we be living? We need to take seriously our condition before the Lord. Okay? We need to be conscious of how we're living day by day and how we're surrendering to the Lord because we are living right now. In 1844, the judgment of the dead started. Okay? And from then until now, God has been going over the books. Jesus has been going over the books and checking those that confessed their sins and repented and gave their life to the Lord and accepted Jesus as their Savior. They have pardon written after their names. Now, that work very soon is going to change to the living. They'll have finished the dead and it will change to the living. What will Jesus find? What will God find written after our names in the book of life? I pray that it will be forgiven, pardoned. It can only be thus as day by day we accept the righteousness of Jesus because we have no righteousness of our own. <laughs> the Bible's very clear on that. Okay? So the only way is that we accept the righteousness of Jesus. And again, as we are tested, as we come to the great point of test, and specifically we're told, over the seventh day Sabbath, and we make the choice, even in the threat of losing our jobs or losing our properties or even our life, because we know there will come a point when a death decree will go forth. But when we make the choice to stand firm, in spite of these threats, we are sealed by the Holy Ghost it, to be in Christ and in his kingdom. And so we're in the sealing times right now. We're living in very serious times because we know that very soon we're going to see these laws and we need to be preparing day by day to make the proper choice at that time. We can't all of a sudden just get there and make the choice. Right now we need to be making proper choices, developing our character in such a way that when that time comes, we'll be able to stand firm by the grace of, of God. Okay? So I want to finish today by looking at the final words of Paul to Timothy just before he was killed. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. And it's my prayer that today each one of us as we go forward can say these words. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I just pray that each one of us will love the appearing of Christ to the point where we'll be willing to die to self and allow him to work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. And I'd like to have you meditate with me as cl I'm closing on the statement here in the back of your bulletin taken from Acts of the Apostles, page 531. None need fail of, obtain of attaining in his sphere to perfection of Christian character. By the sacrifice of Christ, provision has been made for the believer to receive all things that pertain to life and godliness. God calls upon us to reach the standard of perfection and places before us the example of Christ's character in his humanity, perfected by a life of constant resistance of evil the Savior showed that through cooperation with divinity, human beings may in this life attain to perfection of character. This is God's assurance to us that we too may obtain complete victory.
God bless each and every one of you, my brothers and sisters, that this may become a reality in our lives in these days to come.